Welcome everybody, my name's Mary Bosworth and I'm the Director of the Centre for Criminology here at the University of Oxford. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the 16th annual Roger Hood Lecture. Um, and this is very sadly the first annual Roger Hood Lecture that we are going to be holding without our esteemed colleague, colleague and dear friend, Professor Roger Hood, who as you all know, died in November last year after a short illness. So before I introduce our speaker for tonight, I would just like to take a moment to reflect on Roger's work um, with you. So over his lengthy career, Roger pioneered the study of a number of different topics, including race and sentencing, lots of different fields in punishment, including around the prison and, and the borstal, and of course, all of the work that he did on the death penalty, which he also campaigned tirelessly to abolish. In the intellectual depth of his work and in his engagement with policymakers around the world, Roger provided an inspiration and model for us all, which the centre keeps alive through its teaching and research, most notably this year in the establishment of the Death Penalty Research Unit headed by Carolyn Hoyle, who was, after all, one of Roger's students. <clears throat> Roger loved this annual lecture, which Ian Loder established in 2006 in his honour. He attended every one and every year modestly commented on his embarrassment of having an event named for him. Usually we follow the lecture with a dinner at All Souls College where Roger was a fellow, which Roger would help to organize. He'd select the menu and the wine. And at least when I was director, he would often nervously worry about the seating plan ahead of time. We haven't yet been able to celebrate Roger's life properly because of COVID. And so tonight at this lecture, I hope we can all hold him in our thoughts. I'm sure he would have loved this evening's talk as this topic was one of his abiding interests. And of course, our speaker was well known to him too. So let me now introduce our speaker to you. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Coretta Phillips, who is Professor of Criminology and Social Policy at the London School of Economics and Political Science, where she has worked since 2001. Coretta's research interests lie in the fields of race, ethnicity, crime, criminal justice, and social policy. She's currently working on an ESRC funded multidisciplinary project called Gypsy and Traveller Experiences of Crime and Justice since the 1960s. She will be well known to you all as well, I'm sure, because of her book, The Multicultural Prison, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2012, and jointly won the British Society of Criminology Book Prize in 2013 and was shortlisted for the BBC Radio 4 Thinking Aloud and British, British Sociological Association Award for Ethnography in 2014. Tonight, as you can see on the slide on your screen, Coretta will be presenting on the pains of racism in criminology, in which she will describe and analyse the place of race in criminal justice and in criminological scholarship. As she will show, we need to do far more than simply discuss the overrepresentation of specific groups if we are to truly understand the elusive logic of race in our field. Before I hand over to Coretta, just a brief reminder about this online event and how they work, even though now after a year of this, we're all pretty uh, used to it. Um, we took the decision to run this as, as a meeting so that hopefully will enable uh, greater ease of discussion after, the, after Coretta's lecture. What it means though, is it's important to stay muted during her talk. And I believe Steve has wielded the power he, he possesses and has in fact muted you all. Um, so please, however, do, if you have questions, please type them into the chat. And then at the end of the lecture, um, I will either call on you to, to read out your question or I'm, I, I will read out your question for you. I will probably group some questions together um, so as we can have enough time for a good discussion. I believe Coretta's lecture is going to last for about 45 minutes to an hour, which will give us about 30 minutes for questions. We are recording the lecture um, and it will go up on our YouTube account, but we won't record the Q&A. So please keep your video off while Coretta speaks and then please turn it on when she has finished. I will now hand over to Coretta, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, thank you to you and the Oxford team for the invitation to contribute to this uh, fantastic lecture series. I feel really honored 
Um, and like you, I'd like to pay tribute to Roger who died last year. Um, I couldn't say that I knew Roger well, um, but my sense of him was of, uh, as a kind and modest man. Um, and my scholarly interactions with him over the years were really positive. And he struck me as somebody who um, was, you know, very happy and willing to stand alongside young colleagues rather than seeking to tower over them, um, over those working in the same field as him. And I think in our sometimes very unhelpful competitive environment, this really was no small thing. Um, it seems as important to me to remark on um, Roger as a man and to remark on his generosity and his modesty as much as it does to consider his scholarship um, and his legacy, which will be the focus of, of the first part of my talk. So it's been quite a year as far as race goes. Um, so I've had ample material with which to work for this talk. Um, and I'm beginning with this haunting image um, that was produced by the French artist JR. Um, and in it, you can see the disembodied eyes of African-American Eric Garner, a victim of police violence that was not prosecuted by the state unlike, of course, the case of George Floyd. And Ghana's eyes were used on placards, um, which were held by protesters marching across the US in anger following the initial decision against prosecution by federal authorities. And what I particularly like about this image is that the surveillance eyes are turned on sovereign agents who kill with seeming impunity. It manages to convey a bodily a fearful bodily vulnerability that's really hard to disavow. And memorably too, Ghana also was recorded as saying, I can't breathe, just as George Floyd had done. And both men died after police contact in which they were suspected of engaging in um, minor offences. Roger's work wasn't um, specifically focused on policing, of course, but its current relevance is obvious and also um, policing is relevant because it marks the entry point to the criminal justice process. And the reason that I've used this image is not to titillate, um, but because I want to argue that we can learn, in, in my view, much from thinking about race at an effective level, but also at a cultural level to deepen our knowledge of the, the, both the material and the symbolic operation of race in the institutions of the criminal justice system. Now, what I'll be doing in my talk is, um, uh, well, uh, throughout peppering um, my comments with some mater uh, empirical material from research projects that I've undertaken over the last terrifyingly long 30 years, terrifying in the sense that I can't believe it's 30 years. Um, but what I'm gonna be trying to do is to do three, three things. First of all, to reflect on Roger's valuable contribution to the subfield of race and crime, where uh, the subfield that I've worked in for most of my career, and I'll be talking about his landmark study, Race and Sentencing. Um, and I'll be thinking about how we search for racism, in a sense, in our field, um, and the degree to which this requires a reckoning with positivism and its approach to race. And, further thinking through race's ambivalences and complexity in the 2020s. In order to do this, secondly, I'll be trying to draw in what I consider to be the most significant conceptual and theoretical developments in cognate disciplines, particularly, but not only in sociology, um, while also integrating in developments from within our disciplinary field of criminology that offer something beyond what um, Roger was able to do in his uh, research on race and sentencing. And in this, I'll be pointing to some of the weaknesses and frustrations about the state of the field and how it engages with race. And then the third thing that I'd like to do, probably somewhat ambitiously, is to present a preliminary framework of factors that I think are needed to be able to explain race and its relationship to crime, criminalization and criminal justice in the 21st century. 
I can't claim that this will be fully comprehensive. Uh, it, you know, I'm not aiming for a magisterial account in a 45 minute lecture, but I hope it will provide some pointers to, me, to move beyond what many see as um, a kind of stagnation or a stalemate in the race and crime field that focuses almost exclusively on overrepresentation, particularly in our, our um, prison populations. So to do this, I want to look, as I've said, at the role of um, impact of race at the effective and cultural levels. It almost goes without saying, of course, that um, any such analysis should also elaborate the operation of race at the structural and political levels. And I think perhaps because of my intellectual origins in social policy, I'm also very much wedded to the institutional, to the middle range theorizing of race. Um, and to not limit our um, understanding to a kind of structure agency binary. So to think also about the uh, meso level. So I hope um, that this will um, enable a, a critical and reflexive um, discussion about race and its manifestations in our field. And I'll sum up with some summary points. Um, as I've mentioned, Roger was a kind man, and this was also very much evident in him seeking a path towards social justice. And his um, scholarship made the criminological, the political and the normative case for abolishing capital punishment. And of course, many here will be familiar with that linking of racism and death penalty outcomes, particularly but not exclusively in the US context. And Roger's work was all about delegitimizing the power of the state to use supreme violence to kill citizens in an arbitrary and discriminatory way. And so this marries his interests of race and sentencing. So if we turn now to his study that was published in 1992, appropriately funded by the Commission for Racial Equality that had statutory responsibilities for monitoring um, inequality and to enforce the laws against both direct and indirect racial discrimination. What was so impressive about Hood's research um, in this particular study was he was able to overcome many of the methodological weaknesses um, of existing work which had looked at studies of the criminal justice process, particularly looking at the decision to imprison. He had a large sample um, and he was essentially focused on trying to, to, to see whether we could isolate, if we could identify race as a predictor of adverse sentencing outcomes. I won't go into the detail of the study, but I've included some information here about, I think what was particularly significant was the um, way in which he was able to um, draw in a number of variables in his research to try and understand um, what was uh, what the key elements were of, of sentencing decision making and the degree to which they accorded with what we might refer to as legally relevant variables. So he was focused on um, analysing um, or I should say, at least in the beginning, the first part of the research after he'd identified the degree of um, overrepresentation was to develop a prob probability of custody score. And on the basis of this, he was able to argue that 75% of court sentencing outcomes could be explained by legally relevant factors that were to do with um, the offence seriousness, the criminal history of the offender, um, and a range of other relevant factors. But what Hood famously found, the kind of headline findings from the study, was that around, um, he quantified this as being around 24 um, black men um, receiving a custodial sentence that wasn't warranted on the basis of the legally relevant characteristics that could explain that sentence. 
So there was a 5% greater probability of a male black defendant being sentenced to custody than a white male defendant in the five Crown Courts that he was looking at. The study did not find statistically significant variations for female offenders or Asian offenders. Um, and significantly, the findings were um, also very marked in terms of sentence length. And here, in relation to not guilty pleas, an issue that I'll come back to, um, Hood found that there was um, an increased sentence length of, of around nine months for Asian offenders and just over three months for black offenders amongst those who pleaded not guilty. And I think what was um, really valuable about Roger's research was being able to be precise to specify um, the importance of trying to identify a race effect. And remember the historical context was pre-McPherson, there was certainly significant official cynicism and resistance to thinking about racism in the criminal justice system, and particularly in the more rule-bound and bureaucratic nature of um, court sentencing. So Roger's findings were helpful in identifying this residual impact and effect of race. It was also clear that it was hugely um, varied and his research spends lots of time talking about some of the dimensions of that variation, but it wasn't a singular picture, if you like. He also identified the importance of indirect and cumulative effects. So understanding that what happened to offenders at an early point in the criminal justice process would have, could have significant impact on um, their uh, subsequent um, interactions with the criminal justice system. And that was particularly related to, as I mentioned before, um, the degree to which people um, were prepared to uh, cooperate with the criminal justice system, perhaps through um, entering a guilty plea, um, but also raised issues about how um, offenders were uh, receiving legal advice in the police station, for example. So in some ways, what's interesting about, um, uh, interesting for me in revisiting um, Roger's work is to be reminded of how a number of questions that were raised, not ones that he necessarily had time to focus on, um, but nonetheless, he raised a set of questions which we still haven't necessarily got very clear answers to. Um, so the one around why um, minority ethnic offenders are less likely to enter um, a guilty plea, does this relate to access to legal advice, the quality of the legal advice? Does this reflect distrust, a lack of legitimacy? Um, what was also interesting was that Hood found that there were distinct um, offence profiles of black and um, white offenders in particular. Oh, sorry, I think that's my phone ringing. I don't know how to... Sorry. Um, and um, in looking at these offence profiles, what Roger found was that the black offenders were more likely to be involved in robbery offences, um, to be being tried for robbery offences and low level drug supply offences. White offenders were much more likely to be involved in burglary, theft and fraud offences. And, you know, for me, that raises a question about whether racism is implicated in, in so-called offence choices. Um, you know, will you stand out as a black person in an affluent neighbourhood if you're, um, you know, which, which then makes burglary much more risky perhaps than a robbery offence? Is it a function of um, how offences are reported to the police, how they're detected and charged? It simply um, is an area that we still, um, I don't think, have very good answers to. And then the final point was around also um, Roger's finding that um, Asian offenders were um, less likely to, or had lower rates of offending, were less likely to have come before the criminal justice system. 
And I think, you know, that also makes me wonder about the kind of argument that um, Vincenzo Ruggiero has made in relation to um, different kinds of drug supply offences. Um, and, you know, his suggestion that black, black people are discriminated against in the illegitimate opportunity structure just as much as they are in the legitimate one. So I think all of these kinds of um, findings of Rogers have surprisingly not been, um, I don't think, fully interrogated in criminological or sociological research. When um, Roger also identified, and of course we know that um, those of Asian origin, in inverted commas, as a kind of aggregate, we know that they're less likely to be caught up in the criminal justice system, but we don't really know what the reasons for that are. Those of Pakistani and Bangladeshi origin, for example, have a similar age profile, similar socioeconomic profile. They may even be more economically disadvantaged than those of Black Caribbean and, and Black African origin. But they're less likely, as far as we can tell, to be um, caught up in the criminal justice system. Does this suggest that racial hierarchies operate, racial hierarchies and biases operate in different ways? What's the role of faith, religion, culture in experiences of crime and criminal justice? So Roger, in, in thinking through Roger's um, legacy, he certainly didn't overstate his findings. And I think that, that whilst they were open to some um, critique, by and large, they were, I think, um, recognized as um, valid and making a, a, you know, an important contribution to the field. Roger himself didn't assume that, you know, this was the only piece of work that would be done, that his work was the last word on the subject. Um, and the two studies which I think have most closely followed in the tradition of Roger's research have also, well, particularly the study of, um, by Tiggy May and colleagues, um, which was focused on the experience of young people in the criminal justice system, that showed also, like Hoods did, that there is um, not a simple story, that it can be very challenging to summarise um, using multivariate techniques, the impact of race, um, and presumably, therefore, of racism um, in relation to different parts of the process. So, um, May, May um, and colleagues looked at lots of dimensions, pre-court disposals, case dismissals, et cetera, et cetera. And there were quite complex findings. Some predictions of um, ethnicity having an independent effect on adverse outcomes, but it certainly wasn't true across the board. And in the more recent study that was um, published in the BJC with a large Crown Court sample, much more recent data as well, um, based on an analysis looking at Muslim identified names of um, those sentenced, there was no discernible um, race effect. Sorry, I'm struggling with the technology. So the, <clears throat> as I said, I think um, Hood's research was, you know, it held up well under critique and scrutiny. And some will, I'm sure, remember Jot Young's kind of playful reference to voodoo criminology and his suspicion of quantitative criminology um, you know, more generally, he was suggesting that we should be wary of multivariate certainties which divorce understandings of human behaviour from their politicised context. And in essence, the argument was that criminologists should refrain from um, unthinkingly embarking on a path seeking a, a single positivist truth enabled by statistical formulae and, and decimal points. And I think this claim, uh, uh, I'm sure, was kind of overstated. He was playing for laughs. But some scholars, such as Jeff Ward, have, have also wondered about the extent to which um, criminology is, is uh, and perhaps more often criminal justice, um, is essentially complicit in 
um, Waltz um, refers to this idea of bias laundering routines, where we essentially try to claim scientifically whether racism is present or absent in the criminal justice process by depoliticizing inequality, buying into a kind of faulty assumption that we can somehow cleanse experiences of race and racialization in life in general and, and, and move in the direction of a kind of objective certainty, flattening out um, or uh, uh, making opaque the decisions of state agents and elites that oppress and incarcerate racial minorities. And he asks this question in a sense about this um, claim of racial neutrality and for example, factors that count as um, legally relevant. Um, so for example, education and occupational status. And um, I won't go into the details of um, these research studies, um, but what they show quite consistently and they're focused um, on education and, and the labour market is when you take account of the um, effects of what we might also consider to be legitimate factors. So in the context of education, they may be social class and uh, parental and pupil aspirations. Um, and in relation to employment, qualifications, skills, experience, training, et cetera, et cetera. Even once we take into account um, these legitimate relevant factors, we still see an independent influence. We see race as a predictor and it's particularly marked for these groups, those of Black African, Black Caribbean and Pakistani origin. And um, the studies are really quite varied, but what's interesting about them and also really deeply disturbing is that they um, point towards there not being a significant change in the degree to which minority ethnic groups are disadvantaged in, in these ways in the education and employment um, setting. Um, and that particularly in the context of employment, given the relevance of this for understanding criminality and also sentencing, perhaps it's you know, somewhat meaningless to think that we can isolate race or, or as um, Ward suggests that we can, um, you know, we, we're able to kind of launder out the effect of um, these legal factors. And I think it's certainly, I think, not unreasonable to argue that it does tend to privilege an assumption, both methodological but also epistemological, that when we're searching for racism, it's we can only ever be sure that it's present, that it operates in a kind of singular, in a binary way, um, and can only be pinned down definitively using sophisticated statistical techniques. So where does this leave all of us? Where does this leave us in 2021? Um, well, Mary's work with um, Ben Bolin and Maggie Lee was, pretty dismissive about academic criminology's contribution to the race and crime field in 2008. And, and similarly, Williams and Clark um, suggest that there's been a reluctance to talk about racism, to name racism and racialization as being something intrinsic to the criminal justice system. And I think this, you know, these quotes really reflect the frustration that many have felt that the intellectual focus in the race and crime debate has, has stalled. It's been centered on the question of disproportionality in prison populations or in stop and search, um, but it's kind of stagnated. Um, and for myself and um, colleagues, Alpha Palmer, Rodell and, and Daniel, uh, Daniel Smith, we've been quite intrigued by what seems to us to be an inattention to pay, uh, an inattention to questions of race, particularly in the penological context, um, as we say here, worrying signs of criminology is turning away from race. Um, and uh, instead, there is often, it, it seems to be a kind of default to um, the dystopic vision of, of the US and its carceral populations, despite the fact that there have often been high degrees of disproportionality in England and Wales, and certainly um, in, in many other contexts. 
So what I want to do now is to um, think about how we can build on the kinds of research that Roger did. And I think that in order to do that, um, we need to hold together in our minds several dimensions that we need to understand different levels of interaction and intersection, um, both within but also beyond the criminal justice system. And so by this, I mean, we need to consider um, multiple levels to specify the mechanisms and the interacting processes through which race and racism are reproduced. At the micro level, this means examining the interpersonal, but very much, I think, in a phenomenological sense. Um, so it's about, I think, looking at the micro dimensions of race and criminal justice in court settings and to incorporate in some psychoanalytical or, well, probably more valuable, some psychosocial and affective dimensions of race. And then at the meso level, our focus needs to shift to thinking about institutional processes, and that may be policies and practices, which is, is of course, where Roger's work um, was focused, but also to extend beyond to think about neighbourhood environments, to think about political discourse, to, to think about politics with a big and a small p, and to think about the role of media narratives. And then at the macro level, our attention needs to be turned towards structural features of society that frame and intersect institutional processes. And the globalizing forces which have produced fundamental changes in modes of economic production have, of course have impacted and intensified the unequal distribution of resources. And that's not just the resources of income and wealth, as we think about particularly in the high income context, but also land and, and of course, in the context of COVID, we must also think about health too. And all of these forces structure economic, political and social relations in Britain as elsewhere. And this model at the same time also has to recognize that individuals roles in implementing institutional policies um, and also acknowledging that individual actions are uh, and institutional processes will be constrained or enabled by different um, structural features. So I want to think about race at the level of effect and emotion, first of all. And this work has its origins, particularly in um, the work of post-colonial scholar um, Franz Fanon. And we've seen, I think, increasingly an explicit focus on race um, sorry, an explicit focus on emotion and effect as, as being important in helping us understand um, how historical and contemporary systems of racial do domination have been maintained. And we're also interestingly seeing this um, being a focus of um, pedagogical development as we uh, increasingly encourage to make sure that we expose our students to discomforting emotions as a way of trying to engineer um, social change. What Fanon's work of very famously did was to talk about the experiences of, of being racialized. And his work speaks to uh, uh, this idea of a kind of existential discombobulation that's engendered by the ob objectification of black men. And the fact of blackness is essentially, Fanon argued, an effective burden that results from white interaction in which black men specifically are encircled by emotions, feelings of fear, of terror, of rage, and of being and of black men being, particularly black men being perceived of as dangerous, wicked, and ugly. I think what's interesting about Fanon's work is that he always, even in the 90s, this work rather always pointed to the kind of ambivalence of race and also um, its somewhat invisible traces, um, even when he was writing in the 1960s. So um, we know from lots of social um, psychological research as well that people can hold egalitarian ideals, 
and these can coexist at the same time as anti-black minority affect that is you know that causes anxiety distrust fear and hostility so this means that we need to really be careful in articulating how race is manifest in these ways in specific historical moments and geographical contexts, and perhaps even more so when we're in this period, potentially at least, or arguably by some, that we're in a, you know, effectively a, a period of post-race. I've also found Gail Lewis's work with a, a more kind of um, psychosocial um, orientation to be really useful. And she talks about the social language of the skin and the violence of racism. And her work's you know, very much centered on trying to understand the skin's language, to see the emotions that are provoked by um, the skin's color. Um, and it's, and her work is, is particularly poignant, I think, because it talks about the social language of the skin in mixed ethnicity households. And so it, it speaks to the operation of race um, and how it's kind of laid bare in a sense in the intimate settings for families too. And I think it's, it's um, really powerful in, in communicating um, these kinds of ideas about uh, the depth of race in a sense. And I've just included here a few quotes from um, some qualitative research that I've done with Alfred Palmer involved in interviewing doing life histories with um, young minority ethnic Londoners. And here James talks about what that feels like. You'll see white people just holding their bags to themselves. It will be Indian, Asian people as well. I can still feel it. Sometimes it's strong, sometimes it's weak. And I think a, a, a really clear way of, of, um, of underlining aspects of this were also captured in other parts of that. Um, research. And so when I showed one of our interviewees this image of um, a black man who was being photographed um, during the 2011 riots, surrounded by a large number of police officers, and I asked this guy H, and I hasten to add, this isn't like H, like in for those people that are fans of Line of Duty, this was a pseudonym of that H um, provided for himself. Um, and he said, you know, in that in in the, in the um, large number of police officers that were surrounding this man, they're scared of him. And I thought that was that really captures that essence of how self is effectively erased and it's it's distorted through these kinds of labeling processes. And it kind of it also chimes with the work of George Yancey, which um, discusses this, the profound suffering that the white gaze imposes on reading the surface of black and brown bodies that are, are effectively indistinguishable, um, but for their representation as physically or sexually dangerous. And the second quote at the bottom of this slide was also, I think, really evocative of um, how those kinds of traumas of race and racism are intergenerational and so Tyrone was telling this story about a time when his dad was arrested he hadn't been um, subsequently arrested or involved as far as I knew from the interview at least um, in the criminal justice system but his dad was arrested he was a young boy he was really excited about the thought of going in the car with his dad um, because of the you know the emergency um, vehicle having flashing lights and the police officer's response was when he asked, oh, can I go with him? You will one day. Um, and as he says here, I know I was young, but that was something that stuck with me because that was something that I thought was positive, you know, like the idea of going in an emergency vehicle. As I've grown older, my mum and my dad, you know, my dad had to bite his lip. And then um, from some research that I did many years ago now with um, black and Asian um, uh, professionals working in the criminal justice system. Um, this uh, black probation officer, Sue Ann, talked about the misrecognition that happens, um, you know, on a, on a regular basis. And I, 
I liked, but also was disappointed to kind of read this idea that I'm properly dressed with my hair done. Um, there's hardly anything more important than getting your hair done if you're a, um, a black woman. Sorry, that's a slightly um, perhaps inappropriate comment to make, but it's it's reflecting, I think, her sense of professionalism being immediately dismissed by the assumption that she's um, a defendant and, and not a professional. And even more depressing in many ways is the research that's increasingly been, been done around colorism in which, and so for example, Monk's research um, looks at a range of phenotypical attributes such as skin tone, hair, height, weight, body size, faces, etc., notions of physical attractiveness, and suggests that this essentially endows bearers with um, bodily capital, um, with higher or lower status. And in the research, um, and probably all of this should be in inverted commas rather than just darkness, the idea that as, and this was based on um, interviews of, uh, black interviews of black respondents, that a one level increase in darkness and skin tone was associated with higher odds of ever being arrested or ever being incarcerated. Um, a really, I'm sure you'll agree, disturbing finding and particularly troubling um, for someone like myself as who's very, possibly been the beneficiary of, of advantage as a result of being light-skinned. Important implications for research on criminal justice in the UK, given we have a large mixed race criminalised population with a youthful age structure, but there's also probably some really important work to be done around the skin lightening industry, which staggeringly is estimated to be valued at nearly six billion globally. So I want to now turn to thinking about race at the level of epistemology, where of course in increasingly seeing um, disciplinary critiques that take issue with race and racism, um, to think about how research and knowledge is produced. And of course, I don't really need to remind a Oxford audience that university administrations are facing a, perhaps an unprecedented call to be accountable, to fess up to the immorality and the colonial harms of the past, to acknowledge knowledge production in elite institutions um, of the imperial metropole um, were directly implicated in sustaining globalized racial, uh, racialized hierarchies. And there's a, a, an enormous body of work, people like um, Belinda Bambra, Julian Goh, Shelly Ann Tate, Jason Arde, Heidi Safia Mirza, Katie Shan, and others. And they've all spoken to um, or, or considered um, the role of the university and the role of knowledge production in racial hierarchies. And of course, universities are also being called to account for contemporary practices of institutional and structural racism. You know, we can legitimately ask whose knowledge um, used to count and whose knowledge, whose knowledge is must count now and going forward. I did wonder whether this might seem like a, a thinly veiled attack on Oxford. Um, so I've included an image from my own institution, the LSE, um, that's also being held to account and is certainly, in my view, culpable. Our, our uh, institution was founded by Fabianist social reformers, the Webbs and, and George Bernard Shaw. And these, uh, these founders have more recently been denounced for their justification of British imperialism as a benevolent necessity. And it's really not very hard to find explicitly racist references um, in the Web diaries. Beatrice saw the Chinese race is inferior as evolutionary backward Indians are strangely childish to intellect and undisciplined in conduct, uh, in conduct. And together with her husband, they championed 
eugenicist principles to stave off race suicide resulting from low white fertility rates. And I think this seam of thinking took for granted a racial, colonial and geopolitical hierarchy, which has been reshaped, but is still nonetheless important in the contemporary context. We've seen lots of disciplines engaging in self-critical reflection um, of the so-called disciplinary truths. We've seen this take shape in sociology, for example, in a deconstruction of empire, We've seen a shift that's undermined some of the foundational modes of knowledge of the canon of Marx, of Weber, of Durkheim, Giddens, Bourdieu, Foucault, um, all of whom have been criticized for paying scant attention to societies outside of the West. And this complicity in colonial optics um, has effectively homogenized the critiques maintain of homogenized and inferiorized and exoticized people not of the west by neglecting to engage directly with empire building processes of colonization and decolonization and in our field Agazzino's early work I think has been heartbreaking in highlighting some of the emissions of, of what he refers to as bourgeois criminology um, a few weeks ago he was uh, talking at Oxford so many will be familiar with his ideas, I'm sure. But it, it, he was, um, I think it was helpful for him to, to talk about the, what we might see as a kind of colonial amnesia within criminology um, that hasn't taken account of Britain's role in the legitimation of systemic violence and punishment of populations through slavery and colonization, but also in more recent neo-colonial practices and Agazzino um, makes the argument that, there are, that, that um, Western Anglo societies are deeply implicated in the, the political corruption that's evident in a number of African states. There have also been, um, I think, some exciting uh, intellectual partnerships between indigenous scholars um, so, for example, Tauri and Chris Kinnean's work, um, I think, is really useful for making the connections between the historical and the contemporary by looking specifically at the Australian context and thinking about settler colonialism. And also, importantly, to understand impacts intergenerationally and drawing from subaltern knowledges. There is, of course, also the move that we've seen recently in Southern criminology, and even with, and apologies if I'm mispronouncing the name, Ciaccini and Greener have, it, uh, uh, um, uh, have suggested we should be cautious about the idea that Southern criminology is inherently emancipatory. But nonetheless, we are moving in a direction in which there is pressure to decolonize and, and also to reflect more on um, the nature of knowledge production. This is of course relevant for those of us who are um, minority ethnic scholars um, and whose um, occupational lives are within the university setting. Um, having been in the fields for uh, many, many years now, in my 30th year, um, I can be uh, clear and say that it's been painful to do criminology at times. Um, in the first project that I worked on um, with Alice Sampson, listening to Bangladeshi victims talk about their experiences of racist violence, downplaying the harms of having rubbish pushed through their letterboxes. These are the kinds of stories that are hard to hear, interviewing a, a black prisoner who tells me that he's been invited to laugh along with a governor as he tells a nursery rhyme about niggers and God not having enough time to make people black. These, are, these stories can be hard to hear. The kind of pathological othering is not just, it's not just research data. Um, it's, it feels much more like a personal harm, a reaffirmation of vulnerability and of being marked as inferior. And in a sense, how can racism um, not be 
personal? How can it not lead potentially to the kind of burnout that Darnell Hawkins, an African-American scholar, has talked about recently? And to give an indication of what I mean, just, just very recently, I can think of two conversations that I've had, one with a friend who was describing how sad she felt when her nephew was born, um, in contrast to her niece. And this was because she felt that her nephew, understandably, she, she wondered fearfully what would face this child, this male member of her family, and thinking that the odds were stacked against him at age zero. And I've included here a conversation that I had recently with a friend of mine who was talking about a problematic relationship that she's in, an intimate relationship, and talking about how it's really challenging to ask this person who'd been a former partner to leave. And we were having like you do those kind of text conversations. I said she was worrying me a bit. And she remarked, as you can see here, that in a slightly kind of jocular way that there wasn't it, that, that accessing the police as a way to intervene in what might be a dangerous domestic situation was simply not possible um, because she'd worry that they'd end up arresting her and killing her. You'll see from this next bit that the mood was lifted subsequently later on when we picked up our conversation it it descended into wild fantasy with wistful thinking about Idris Elba um, who after all is of course the most attractive man in England ever um, and back to the kind of more serious experiences of um, being a minority um, ethnic scholar in, um, in criminology. I would certainly agree with Elijah Anderson's statement that there's, there can often be no protection, no sanctuary, no escaping racism. There are equivalent nigger moments. So I, like the black probation officer, experienced the signaling of my inferior status at an informal lunch before an editorial board meeting of the British Journal of Criminology, where a white female professor joined a conversation and repeatedly tried to hand me um, a bundle of administrative documents, apparently blind to my academic status, assuming that the only minority ethnic woman in the room could was very obviously a publishing assistant. But its presence can be felt in multiple other ways. Major texts appear contributing to the canon that include chapters on gender, on sexualities, but race is effaced. Perhaps here the argument is that there are too few heavyweight scholars to, do, to deliver the goods. And the implicit criticism, sometimes explicit, of race-focused research as being too polemical, too emotional, re reinforces this I think quite nasty assumption of a kind of intellectual primitivism set against intellectual superiority found in elite and research active institutions. It, of course, assuming that erroneously, I think that objectivity is positionless and something to be realistically um, aimed for. And I think when the articulations of these kinds of pains, these personal stories of racial injury experienced over decades are subject to gaslighting are dismissed as anecdotal bias um, and, or an example of special pleading, I experience a form of secondary victimization. And I too, like um, Darnell Hawkins, am finding my garden increasingly attractive over life in the racialized university setting. I want to just make one final point here that I found really valuable in the work of Emma Baron Desmond in thinking about disciplinary um, reflexivity. And they maintain that we must be scrupulous in our analysis of racial domination, um, to be open to striking down the shibboleths of con and conventional wisdoms where appropriate. And I I think this is a point that's really well made. Um, we do need to be careful in our analysis 
Um, and it may seem very surprising to be referring to Lombroso here, um, but I think it's also worth noting that, that whilst Lombroso did, of course, focus on these um, uh, inferior evolutionary backward races that included the Negro, he also, in talking about homicide rates um, globally, recognised um, that the coloured offender um, against the law is judged and condemned in a great in, in a way that was much more severe than white offenders. Um, he does revert back to the characteristic problematic um, essentializing of uh, negative behavioural traits associated with the Negro, but I think it's worth recognising that there was some nuance, in a sense, um, at least in some parts of his argument. So I want to now turn to think about culture, and I imagine that some people might be bristling at the mention of culture in, in the same sentence as race and crime. And uh, uh, the way I'm thinking about culture is, first of all, recognising that any um, kinds of cultural explanations in the race and crime field must attend to the cultural domination of whiteness and, and to recognise um, as Alexander does, that we need to look upwards and outwards to look at the cultures of those in power. We need to um, also think about those, the cultures that comprise the norm, constitute the structures, and therefore whose lives, discourses, and actions often barely register as cultural. And we're increasingly seeing um, criminology pay attention to whiteness to white supremacy, to the dividends of whiteness, and to also think about the dis disavowal of ethnicity and color blindness. I'm not sure how I'm doing for time. I can't see my clock. Um, you have been going for almost an hour. Well, actually, I guess we started a little bit late, so you, you're sort of starting to run out of time, but. Okay, well, I'm, well, I'm gonna talk really quickly to go through the last few slides. Um, strategy. <laughs> I have mentioned before the um, my interest in in looking at culture, the value of, of um, middle range theorizing, and I think this is useful because it can guard against the kind of structural determinism in which minority groups are seen as being propelled towards criminality by powerful economic and political forces alone. There's of course the inherent risks of pathologization. But I think that it's worth us stepping back in a sense and thinking about the fact as Tarek Madhu does, which is that cultures are not entirely imposed from the outside. They're not, um, you know, that, that, that we need to understand um, subjectivity, his focus is in looking at Muslim subjectivity, um, as being produced and shaped by internal resources and foci as well as um, structural pressures. And I think this then leads us to thinking about potentially positive cultural responses to racism. Um, and I've included here in these slides, I won't go through all of them, but some indication of the relevance of culture in criminal justice practice. This first quote um, identifying um, the challenges of being um, accommodated in a hostel outside of an area, it, well, essentially in a predominantly white area, and the hostel manager um, suggesting that he didn't go to an area that he would feel comfortable in to get food, because this is not a good area. And this is that this was, this was home. This is the area where I feel safest. There's also in the second quote, some reference, of course, to um, the importance of culture being relevant in, um, how criminal justice practitioners respond to their clients as, for example, probation, those um, under community sentences and those um, also in prison. I want to just then jump ahead very quickly to also recognize that cultural adaptations to racism have been um, increasingly the focus of criminological research. We can go back again to um, 
uh, to Lombroso's work, um, when he was reflecting on um, the overrepresentation of Jewish people as um, receivers of stolen goods, he also reflects on their persecution, the um, impossibilities of them being able to um, access employment um, and also experiencing desperate poverty. Um, and, and so in this sense, offending was Lombroso speculated potentially a, a kind of hedge against violence. And the more recent um, Anivar and uh, Gabadon and Burt's research also um, tries to empirically test the relationship between experiences and perceptions of racism and discrimination um, and to understand the degree to which these then promote either weak social bonds to um, institutions um, or lead to assumptions that trying to seek success legitimately through education and employment won't lead to the kinds of rewards that um, are expected um, for those of us from minority ethnic groups. I won't go through, in the interest of time, I won't go through these individually, but what I also think is helpful for us to understand in the broader race and crime context is to think about the potential ways in which race may operate. We'll be familiar with things like stop and search, um, acting as a performance indicator um, for officers, and we can anticipate that this will have a significant impact on um, racist stopping without reducing crime. Um, and another example that I think we could think more creatively about is, for example, in custodial sentencing, um, and this idea was uh, a one um, suggested to me by um, a employee of a third sector gypsy and traveler organization, which, um, and, and her, her argument was in essence that when sentences think about the time and life that's forfeited in imposing a custodial, custodial sentence, it operates effectively with an assumption that um, all, minority ethnic groups and majority, uh, all ethnic groups have a similar life expectancy. And actually um, that, that isn't the case. And my colleague in Sakok has done work recently looking at modern slavery legislation and the identification of black and mixed race offenders as so-called modern slave masters um, prosecuted in the context of county lines uh, offending and she suggests this operates as a way of denying responsibility for Britain's role in the slave trade um, in the transatlantic slave trade and hopefully you will see from um, the examples that I've included here numerous other points in which institu institutional policies and practices um, can um, racialise in ways that produce um, adverse outcomes for minority ethnic groups. And that's everything from signifiers that are used in court cases of joint enterprise um, to the way in which bordering practices um, are reflective and magnify existing and historical racial hierarchies performing a kind of ideological function of deciding who belongs and, and who doesn't. And that's of course been um, amplified very much in the, in, the, um, in the context of the digital worlds in which criminal justice now occurs um, more frequently. Okay, I'm going to try and sum up very quickly the next few slides, given that I'm sure um, people will be ready for uh, a break and, and, and more interaction. It should be obvious, and I'm probably breaking a copyright regulation here, so apologies, but uh, of course um, we can't not think about the political context in thinking about race and crime. Um, you know, we have a 
prime minister who, um, although technically he was a backbencher, he was a leader in waiting, using um, offensive language to talk about um, uh, tr some traditional Islamic dress. And the postcard, if you can see it on Zoom, um, also makes reference to the um, degree of anti-Semitism that we see in British pol politics, but also, of course, outside politics and the relevance of Islamophobia. What's interesting, I think, about the current context is um, that dog whistle politics operate, the kind of dog whistle operates in ways which um, it can be as effective as, as being directly um, discriminatory. There are, there is the same presence of overt racism, but for example, in my um, reference to Boris Johnson and, and what he said about traditional Islamic dress, he also wasn't in favour of a ban um, that's been imposed in a number of other countries. One further example of the kind of political nature of race and crime. This was um, a post in my, uh, on one of my local Facebook groups, um, which signifies the really visceral and, and really, I think, deep rooted hatred of um, gypsies and travellers. And then we had a minority ethnic um, Home Secretary introduce the policing crime um, sentencing and courts bill, which effectively, and I really can't, there may well be legal scholars who can argue otherwise, but I can't see how it doesn't criminalise nomadic cultures in a really um, blatant way. It's a kind of, I think, a, a barely disguised, a very cynical attempt to, um, to court um, home counties voters who are opposed to the presence of gypsies and travellers. Interestingly, the National Police Chiefs Council and the Association of Police and Crime Commissioners um, were not in favour in the consultation, were not in favour of increased powers. When have you heard of, ever heard of the police not being in favour of increased powers? Um, but they suggest that existing legislation is already sufficient. Coretta, it would be nice if we could have a little bit of time to discuss. So, yes. so this... I'm just, I think maybe then I'll end with this slide. Um, it, I think it's uh, evocative of um, the perception of, of young people that Alpha and I interviewed, um, reflecting on what are the kind of, um, consistencies and continue at the continuities between historical globalized racial orders and also um, those that exist in the contemporary period. And I also have to just make one last comment about the importance of um, political activism. We are in a moment when we've seen extensive social movements um, uh, protesting around race. And we've also seen connecting, I think, to Roger's um, focus on abolitionism a move towards thinking about police abolitionism and also prison abolitionism. And it's quite hard for us, I think, in some ways to be um, positive at the moment, but resistance is never futile. And I hadn't realized that this is actually a, a kind of trekky thing. I'm not a trekky, um, but it does give me an opportunity to um, name check my intellectual older brother, Ben Bowling, one of the few um, uh, minority ethnic black uh, professors um, who's written a song called Martin Luther King was a Trekkie. I'll, Perhaps I'll leave it there and not sum up with my concluding thoughts so that we've got more time, but I'll leave the slide up perhaps so that people can, can make reference to some of the things that I've, I've talked about.